People haven't really thought so much about the impact of plant pandemics on the global food supply. And there's several examples, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but I've given them here. And, you know, people claim that, in fact, famine and malnutrition has affected more people than COVID-19 has, which is a sort of somewhat uh, different view that you might get from the, uh, from the popular press. Again, quarantine, there's a certain number of parallels between what's being implemented for the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, quarantine is an important control measure. Population monitoring is important of pathogens, but it's poorly developed. <clears throat> Asymptomatic plants are problematic and foster long distance spread. Uh, COVID-19 and plant pandemics disproportionately affect lower resource countries. And it's a major problem for global food security. <clears throat> and they can trigger mass migrations and political instability. So <clears throat> when we're breeding for disease resistance, you know, it's the most effective way of delivering uh, <clears throat> a countering plant pandemics. Uh, the useful de definition for durable disease resistance that we're all aiming at is resistance that remains effective over long periods of agriculture, widespread agricultural use. This was put forward by Roy Johnson back in 1984. And it's a very good review, but they really didn't have the tools to address <coughs> the um, to address <coughs> the issues. The way I see, we have a variety of strategies to increase the durability of resistance. We've got the low-tech, take uh, classical resistance genes, pyramid, or stack them. These should be deployed in heterogeneously in space and time. Medium tech, there are durable resistance genes out there, and we should look at those and try and incorporate them into our breeding programs. We can consider transgenic cassettes. And importantly, with the new tools, we can use the knowledge of pathogen variability to inform strategies for resistance gene deployment. And then the sort of more radical, uh, <clears throat> radical high-tech approaches that I'm not going to have time to uh, go into today, but they involved RNAi and host-induced gene silencing. But what we're really trying to do is to slow down this boom and bust cycle. Right? <clears throat> you have uh, breeding for resistant cultivars with an input of germplasm, a new variation, and if it's successful, you have rapid deployment of the resistant cultivar. That puts a steep selection pressure on the pathogen population, and you get changes that re render resistance ineffective. And at the moment, this equilibrium is somewhat driven over to the left, but what we're trying to do is to move it over to the right. In, so we want to maximize the evolutionary hurdle to virulence. And the way that I think about this is I used to take the analogy of the influenza paradigm, where the WHO, the World Health Organization, monitors variation in the <clears throat> influenza virus, and it approves the mix of uh, strains that should go into producing the vaccine against influenza. So they're continually monitoring the pathogen <clears throat> and then designing vaccines against it. Now, we basically need to do the same. We need to continually monitor the pathogen and then uh, use that information to identify effective resistance genes and then decide which ones to deploy, again, in heterogeneous space and time. So again, we're trying to maximize the evolutionary hurdle. So my lab works on a number of different projects. I'm going to touch briefly on some Bremia genomics, that's Bremia lettuce down in mildew, and some lettuce genetics. <clears throat> so lettuce is a very important crop, particularly in California. You can see the scale of agriculture here. Uh, when I visited Brazil, I realized that you produce lettuce is much more local around uh, <clears throat> the major cities where it gets distributed. 
In the US, they have these very large fields, particularly in California and Arizona, and that supplies the whole of the US. This sets the scene for epidemics, and the major pathogen is lettuce downy mildew. <clears throat> so we continually monitor lettuce downy mildew. It's caused by bremia. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and <clears throat> we've collected isolates for the last 30 or 40 years. And then uh, we decide what, we what resistance genes are going to be affected. <clears throat> so <clears throat> one of the things we've done with the new technologies is to get very good genome sequences of a number of different downy mildews. I'm just showing you one comparison here. Uh, P. effusa, Peronospora effusa, is a uh, spinach downy mildew. Um, using hi-fi sequencing from the PAC bio, that's given us very, very good reads. And we've basically got telomere to telomere. There's only one gap in the uh, <coughs> around the nucleolar organizing region. And then we've got Bremia, where we've got a pretty good, uh, it's not quite telomere to telomere, but it's certainly very good, and we've genetically validated it. And then when we look at syntony between the two downy mildews, there's a remarkable degree of collinearity between their genomes. And what this says is you can take inferences from one downy mildew and make uh, <clears throat> inferences to the other. And the downy mildews are polyphyletic. That is so that they've evolved multiple times from hemibiotrophic pathogens like phytophthorates. So this really becomes, uh, what it says is these plant pathogens are not radically re rearranging their genomes. Uh, so you've basically got a template for all the Perinosporaceae, that's all the Phytophthora species, all the downy mildews. Now, of course, some will be uh, more variable, but uh, we're expecting and we, we're finding out that many of the downy mildews and Phytophthora species have essentially collinear genomes. So on the <clears throat> host side, uh, you know, this is a fairly standard workflow for identifying re disease uh, resistance genes and other genes. You do genetic uh, evaluate, you do germplasm screens, genetic evaluation, fine map, and then work your way through various technologies to get validate the gene. Now, <clears throat> it used to be that getting a molecular marker linked to your gene was sufficient, but if you want to use genome editing, as I believe you've heard in other um, talks in this in the seminar series, or will do, you've really got to have the candidate gene. And so you want to know, you want to be able to get uh, CRISPR knockouts to validate the, uh, that you've got the actual gene. Before I get on to that, I just want to mention a, uh, a new technique that we've just published for identifying polymorphisms. At the moment, if you're doing genetic mapping, you typically will sequence your parents you'll map the reads back to a reference genome to identify SNPs. And if the, uh, the reference genome is somewhat different from the parents being used, that can be problematic. You'll uh, miss a lot of polymorphisms. Now we've published a, a <clears throat> in this paper, which just came out a couple of weeks ago, you can actually work with k-mids and you identify unique k-mids to each parent and you don't need to use a reference genome. So this is particularly important for species that don't have a high quality reference genome. And also it detects large numbers of polymorphisms. They can be SNPs as well as indels that other pipelines often miss. It'll work with uh, different populations. And also interestingly enough, it works pretty well if you've got adequate read depth with reduced complexity GBS, the genotype and by sequencing reads. And we've applied this to both plants and pathogens, and it works very well. <clears throat> so one of the ways to drill down to get at what resistance genes you have, you can clone uh, candidate avirulence genes from the pathogen based on sequence, which we've done. In the OMI seats, there are uh, classic signatures for likely um, the so-called RXLR proteins. You can clone them and you can express them using agrobacterium transiently into resistant uh, and susceptible cultivars. And you can then get this uh, typical, as you see on the left-hand panel, uh, HR, necrosis, when you've got detection and you don't get that necrosis in a susceptible plant. So that allows you to drill down, you can map 
<clears throat> you can map that reaction. And <clears throat> we've done fine mapping for a particular set of um, AVR genes. We also use the Kamer association mapping approach. And all lines of evidence pointed to one R gene in this case. Uh, and what was particularly uh, important about this was to use isoseq reads rather than short read sequencing looking at transcripts. And it revealed that we, we had a canonical NLR in the reference genome, but in the resistance genome, it picked up the NLR plus another open reading frame that uh, we think is a um, kind of like a indicator domain that is for involved in resistance. So very important to use isoseq data if you can. And then when we take that particular uh, sequence, and again, using agrobacterium mediated transient expression, we can co-express it with the avirulence gene candidate and the resistance gene, and we get specific HR. And uh, it's easier to see in the right-hand picture there, other fluorescence. So this was a very relatively rapid way. We didn't have to generate transgenics. It was, so you had the information initially that we identified the candidate gene based on sequence, the resistance gene, we could map and then go down to the candidate gene and then use transient assays to demonstrate that we had the resistance gene. So as you get more and more resistance genes, you, you then have a little bit of a conundrum. You want to pyramid them, but it would be a lot of work to put them all together by classical plant breeding. So what you'd like to do is to generate gene stacks at a single chromosomal position. And then it, this would be inherited as a single Mendelian unit. One can think about putting as a selectable herbicide resistance marker in the middle, and you could adjust the resistance genes to the needs of the area. But this is going to need efficient editing systems for gene, ad gene addition at specific sites, and we don't have yet have that. But I uh, envisage that uh, coming along in the next, uh, certainly the next five to 10 years, if not sooner. So what we'll be then doing is getting a cassette like you see at the bottom, where you're targeting different pathogens. You have, in this case, acetylactate synthase as a uh, herbicide resistance marker that the plant breeder can use. And then uh, the herbicide resistance then will have the cassette of resistance genes. And I'll bring it along rapidly. So segueing a little bit then, you know, we're all heavily impacted by COVID-19. Thinking when we come out of this, what's gonna be the impact on plant breeding? Well, <clears throat> hopefully uh, there'll be a greater appreciation for science that uh, the response to the pandemic is science driven. I know uh, the US as elsewhere, it's become a heavy political politicized issue, but uh, there is a realization of the importance of science. Maybe there will be appreciation of, threat of uh, the threat of plant pandemics, the food supply. There's beginning to be discussions about that. There's a lot more funding being put into uh, pandemics on the human side, and maybe we'll see some trickle down, hopefully, into, uh, into uh, plant pandemic funding as well. Well, certainly we're gonna see more virtual and hybrid conferences. Uh, we need increased monitoring of pathogens and the variants. Certainly there's going to be a dramatic increase in diagnostic technologies. The, the COVID funding has really driven much more, uh, much cheaper, faster, and some very novel technologies. I think we're gonna see high throughput screening of plant pathogens. Even before COVID came along, uh, you're seeing technology development driven by medical diagnostics. And I think one example is the smidgen from Oxford Nanopore, and also there's isothermal PCR in field diagnostics. Here you've got your, your iPhone and then a little gadget that will plug into uh, the iPhone and a little cassette that goes into the smidge iron uh, that potentially can do real-time uh, real sequencing, put the results up into the cloud, 
and the, the analysis gets done in real time. I want to segue a little bit into um, what we've done for screening for COVID. And one of the reasons for talking about this is that we have actually redeployed uh, technology that's routinely uh, used in the ag biotech sector. And also there's a Corteva connection up here because we uh, set this up after consulting with Corteva. <clears throat> so I knew that there was, high, there was technology for high throughput screening uh, that was being used. And particularly the ag biotech companies, uh, the middle, uh, the Nexar liquid handling platform you see in the middle, that's capable of generating 150,000 data points a day. And some of the big companies will have 10 of these machines running so they can generate millions of data points a day, way more than the medical community was testing for COVID. And then on the left-hand side, you see the IntelliCube, which is actually a QPCR platform. The next hour is an endpoint machine. But they basically both rely on the technology you see to the right, which is an array tape, which is effectively uh, hundreds of micro titer plates, 768 wells at a time in a long array. And that allows you to do very high throughput QPCR or PCR. So in discussions with Corteva, before we set this up, uh, <clears throat> you know, what, what lessons were there from the ag biotech? Well, if you want to do fast uh, screening, high throughput screening, it's got to be quick. It's got to be actionable data in real time. Don't sample more than you need. It's got to be robust, tolerant of different samples, simple, minimize the number of steps, get into the microtape, microtider plate format as soon as possible, and to minimize cost, use small reaction volumes. <clears throat> and we put all this in place. Uh, we're now a clear certified lab. You see two uh, IntelliCubes here. One of the big challenges actually is sample collection. We, we took over the, the gym and the university and so we uh, sample eight hours a day, seven days a week. We're capable of uh, sampling 32,000 samples per week. Uh, basically, it all relies on saliva. We have It's very easy, very quick, and we have a high level of compliance. If you want to come onto campus, you have to be tested at least once a week. And this is for asymptomatic individuals. So it relies on taking a small amount of saliva into a barcoded tube. It's put in a rack, the 96 well format, in the collection kiosk. These are barcoded. They can get red in the barcoder, heat inactivate the virus, automatic decapper, put in the 384 well plate. And actually one of the, the challenges of working with saliva is it's very uh, viscous. Another agricultural biotech twist here is you know, when you eat papaya, your lips tingle. That's because the protease is doing a number on your, on your saliva. And just treating with papain for 30 minutes gets rid of the viscosity problem. <clears throat> it gets put in a 384 well plate, and then it gets in the QPCR machine. It's fully automated uh, set up the reaction. And a couple of hours later, you get your reports. That gets put up in the cloud and the results are called. This is efficient, cheap, and fast. <clears throat> so we've uh, been that, we've now done over half a million uh, results and we uh, re report the results back within, mostly within 24 hours. So that relies for rapid contact tracing. And as a consequence, we've been able to keep the prevalence of COVID very, very low on the campus. And we're now doing the surrounding city. And again, that keeps the, uh, the prevalence very, very low. <clears throat> so the technology that I've just shown you was actually originally designed for detecting SNPs in, <clears throat> in plant breeding material. So it's a logical extrapolation to deploy that technology for detecting SNPs in the virus. And as you know, there are different uh, variants that are spreading around the world. And 
we've instituted high throughput uh, variant analysis based on SNPs. Genotyping on SNPs is much cheaper, faster, lower tech than sequencing. Sequencing is very important to detect the various variants there, but once you have them, it's much quicker and more effective to do genotyping. Now, this is a bit of a uh, shift in the way that people are thinking about this, and certainly the, uh, uh, much of the community still wants to rely on sequencing. But there's very little point sequencing uh, the same thing tens of thousands of times. The amount of information you get back decreases asymptotically as more sequences, uh, as more samples are sequenced. So genotyping is complementary to sequencing. And the way that we use this is a <clears throat> simple probe competition assay. Now, the COVID is exactly the same as the standard COVID test, where the COVID test has just one probe. So you have a probe here that hybridized to your sequence, you have two primers, and then you have a mismatch match probe set, and the probe that hybridizes to your target sequence gets degraded by the nuclease activity of the uh, <coughs> DNA polymerase after the RT reaction. And we have probe sets for all the common, uh, common mutations, We've got about 25 assays currently working, though uh, we only run a subset of those in production. If you run a more qPCR machine, uh, you get these types of traces. You can, there's uh, on the left in blue, there's the wild type. On the right, you've got a clear separation, a clear um, of the, the variant for N501Y, this mutation that's um, that's present in the strains that originally developed in uh, the UK, South Africa, and Brazil. If you want to do endpoint, these are the types of clusters you'll see, very, very similar to the types of readouts that, you, that you get if you're doing genotyping with this assay. We can use multiple sample types. Some is raw saliva, some have extracted RNA. We're basically using the residual from whatever assay has been used for um, for the COVID test. <clears throat> it could be uh, determined on a conventional BCR machine with a fluorescent plate reader. It's pretty low tech. So now we uh, routinely screen all our positive viral samples uh, for variants. We screen symptomatic, asymptomatic individuals, we have a panel 14 loci that are informative. And therefore, within a few days of sample collection, as long as the, the viral titer is high enough, i.e. CQ is less than uh, 30, we'll get an answer within a day or two. At the moment, we're sequence validating if it's, uh, if it's uh, a variant of interest. Now, final slide. COVID-19 is a global problem. We need to uh, do rapid, inexpensive genotyping of a large proportion of positives on a global scale. Uh, <clears throat> now, and this would involve global monitoring in many countries where sequencing just is not feasible. Uh, I've pointed out it's complementary to sequencing. And there is a flexibility for continual development and deployment of new genotypic assays as new SNPs appear in, uh, and as new variants appear. You know, the virus is continually evolving. If you put a steep selection pressure up, uh, as uh, more people get vaccinated, they represent a very uh, steep uh, selection pressure. The variant is going to evolve such that their uh, vaccines are less effective and we need to be able to monitor them. So uh, I'm uh, keen to get this, uh, this um, technology deployed globally. And if there are people in the audience here who would like to be involved and you're interested in receiving some of the probe sets as an access program, please contact me, my, my email's down below. So I just want to say that this is the result of some of the results. Uh, a large number of people in my lab that worked very hard. I have a number of wide uh, group of collaborators and funding from various sources. And uh, 
I'll be very happy to take questions. Thank you, Professor Mutchamor. What amazing presentation. I am not ashamed to say I'm so jealous because you were, you were able to test so, so many people in the campus. I don't know if you are aware of uh, what we are facing now here in Brazil. I don't know what kind of uh, information do you have uh, from for what what were if, uh, uh, you know what we are having here regarding pandemics we are now uh, mostly like most likely uh, facing the third wave uh, with uh, so many dead people and uh, people are gathering in the streets and the government uh, seems uh, they, they don't care about us, so uh, it, it will be really interesting to take this opportunity uh, to know a little bit more uh, and how, how about we can uh, approach these results more effectively. effectively. Mm -hmm. Right, no, I, one of the reasons for giving the presentation is, uh, you know, People say, well, I run the Genome Center and therefore, uh, you know, we repurpose the Genome Center to do the screening and now the variant analysis. And people say, well, it must have been a big transition. And I say, no, not really. I have been studying pandemics for nearly 40 years. Mm -hmm. Now there have been plant pandemics, mm -hmm. right? But much mm -hmm. of the thinking and the technology, as I've just shown, can be applied to COVID. And many of, it's, it's, it's relatively simple technology. And so many labs, if they wanted to do this, could do this. Mm -hmm. And so, as I say, if people are interested, they should reach out to me and we, we should discuss, uh, okay. you know, mm -hmm. the, the molecular biology is actually relatively the simple part. Mm -hmm. The logistics of collecting very large numbers of samples Right. Yes. And then the downstream of the contact tracing, the isolation, they are actually more challenging mm -hmm. than the middle part, the, the, the actual assay. Mm -hmm. But uh, you mentioned uh, about funding, about science yeah. funding, and we are not very hopeful here uh, because uh, uh, they are cutting our budget every single year. Uh, mm -hmm. since 2015 and uh, uh, federal universities are now facing uh, many constraints about money and uh, it's, it's really a different and hard situation for us and uh, I, I would like to uh, shift a little bit uh, for one question uh, regarding uh, variability in plant breeding, pathogen variability in plant breeding. Uh, how can we use this information fast enough? Because we know that the, the, the shift is really uh, quick. So yeah. how can we use this information fast enough in a plant breeding? And, and uh, in a, a kind of an analogy, how can we use the information in COVID-19 with this uh, uh, variability in, in helping uh, our population? I think there's some very good um, parallels. It's a question of thinking about maximizing the evolutionary barrier to the pathogen, right? So if you expose a single resistance gene, if you're dealing with soy rust, you know, if you, you can screen your germplasm, you can get a wonderful 100% protection. You put that single resistance gene out there, how long is it gonna last? Mm -hmm. Two, three years at the most, mm -hmm. probably. And maybe there's existing variation you just haven't found yet. Mm -hmm. But if you have a cassette of three or four resistance genes, the evolutionary barrier is higher. 
And so if you can make a cassette, either by traditional breeding, you know, pyramid it by traditional breeding, you'll get a transgenic cassette in. Then I think hopefully it may last between five and 10 years. But you can't just say, okay, job done. You've got to have a pipeline continually mm -hmm. coming in, right? So again, I, that's where I get back to the influenza paradigm. Mm -hmm. When the WHO is making vaccines each year for flu, every year it's different mm -hmm. based on knowledge of what is likely to cause a problem. Now, it's sometimes they get it right and sometimes they don't get it so right. But again, I, I think that's what we have to do. Now with COVID, <laughs> one of the advantages of the RNA-based vaccines is that it's relatively easy just to make another sequence. Mm -hmm. So I think what they're going to have to do there is to get a pipeline, and you're already seeing it with Moderna and Pfizer, that they mm -hmm. are saying you're going to have to have a booster dose with the new variants, right? And they're even talking again of maybe you'll get better protection if you get vaccinated with different types of vaccine, which again is like deploying different types of resistance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what we need to think about is maximizing the evolutionary hurdle mm -hmm. to the pathogen. So from your point of view, uh, you, you have to keep uh, looking at the COVID-19 COVID uh, from uh, now on, maybe next year, another vaccine. Right. So I think what we've, we also, we need to uh, be monitoring for pathogen variation. And then if like the AstraZeneca in some places doesn't seem to be as effective, mm -hmm. you stop using it, right? And you come mm -hmm. in with another vaccine. There's no point deploying a vaccine. It's like there's no point deploying uh, a cultivar that might have been highly resistant five years mm -hmm. ago, but now okay. is completely susceptible to most of the strains. Mm -hmm. If you say it's resistant and you plant it out and the farmers find it susceptible, it erodes the confidence of the farmers in that resistance, right? They won't mm -hmm. believe you next time. Mm -hmm. right? And I think there's a lot of parallels between vaccine deployment and deploying how we deploy resistant cultivars. Okay. Thank you, Professor Mitchell Moore. You know that we have a breakout room now. Right. Okay. So yes, we can well, chat. I, we can chat a little bit more there. So you want me okay. to log off and then log back on the the different one? Yes, I believe so. And uh, it was an amazing experience to have you here with us. Thank oh, you you're so very much. welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.